Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com on this February 19th, 2015 day on our calendar. And, you know, the other day I was uh, doing a show on the similarities between Catholicism and uh, Islam, and uh, it's striking to me that with all that's going on in the news today, it really shows how we're not really, the American people are really not getting the truth regarding what's behind the terrorist attacks and how the powers that be are trying to limit any kind of discussion outside of the way they frame this war on terror. And I find it quite interesting that... uh we never really deal, first I want to deal with one issue, and that is, what is this name ISIS? And I said in a show, uh, oh, maybe a month ago, that by that name alone, it shows you who created this terrorist organization and who's been creating these things from the beginning. So I found a, uh interesting uh, article written by Thomas R. Horn, and it's called Domes, Obelisks, and Magic Squares. Oh my, he says, how the most powerful nation on earth beckons the evil one. And this one is a book, it's called Apollo, Apollyon Rising 2012. It was written, I believe, back in 2010. And, uh, I thought I'd comment on this and show you that the symbols of ISIS are standing right in the backyard of the of Washington D.C. of London and in the Vatican, and what we're getting here is a lot of double talk by our politicians who know, I believe, the high level ones know really this story and what's going on, and are basically setting us up for a World War Three. And I'm going to paraphrase this. Uh, article to help you along with what I'm trying to prove here, or at least to present to the American people. Now, if you've read Apollo Apollon on Rising 2012, the lost symbol found in the mystery of the great seal revealed, then you, you learned an important secret concerning the capital city of the United States. Now, according to Mr. Horn, the world's foremost authorities including Robert Hieronymus, uh, United States official records, and even Freemason scholars. Washington, D.C., folks, wasn't designed with freedom in mind. It was designed as a symbol of the Rosicrucian dream shared by its builders. And uh, who were those builders? Well, we know that Washington uh, commissioned it. It was basically our founding fathers. Now, there was one story I've done a long time ago, and I said there's a founding father that's never mentioned. And he's a Jesuit priest who I believe uh, was one of the biggest strategists of how to create this hidden agenda and how to uh, basically open up Washington, open up America to the Catholic Church, who wasn't uh, in the Vatican, who really was... uh, not wanted in many places. Uh, I think our history should begin back in the 1600s when they tried to blow up Parliament in in England and work our way from there. But anyway, uh, that secret founding father is Lorenzo Ricci, and he was a Jesuit general, and I've done many stories on that. Now, the Rosencrucian dream shared by its builders, the America would become the oh, let's call it the New Atlantis, and uh, eventually lead the world into a restored golden age of Osiris. Now, that has a lot to do with ISIS. And I've given you the story, the Egyptian uh, goddess Isis, and I've given you her story, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and how it relates to what we're doing today. Now, first of all, let me mention something here. There's Christianity involved in this. We've uh, just yesterday, everyone's calling this now on TV a holy war. So let's put it into perspective from uh, our point of view, not 
the points of view that are given to you on TV. Now, first of all, there's Christianity, there's Catholicism, and there's Islam. And none of them share the same uh, principles. Now, <clears throat> what the President of the United States is saying is that uh, Islam, he won't even call it uh, extreme Islamic terrorists. Uh, and basically what he's saying is he doesn't want to offend the many millions of Muslims that are good people, and I agree with him on that. But the many millions of Muslims that are good people are not adhering. They're more moderate. They're not adhering to what the Koran really says. And I think what we need to do sometimes is look at the Koran and compare it to Christianity. Now, the one thing that gets confused here is we think that Catholicism is Christianity, but it's not. It's the farthest thing from it. When you really look at the traditions that have been added by these crazy popes, and what's down the years, we've seen that Catholicism and the Vatican have tortured uh, Bible-believing Christians, just as they engaged in fights with the Crusades, when whether the Crusades uh, were a reaction to the Muslim attacks or whether the, uh, the Crusades were... Uh, actually instigating Muslim attacks. The real question is, it seems that the Vatican's in the middle of this, fighting both Bible believers and Christ uh, Christians and Muslims. And then we can take it one step farther, and there's solid evidence that needs to be presented that in 700, when this Islamic religion came uh, into public view, that it could have been stimulated and written by the Vatican itself to create another enemy where they would put in the end times what uh, many of the extreme terrorists now in the Islamic world are stating this is the end times and we will fight to the end until this basically until basically Jesus comes back yeah that's what they say and the most uh, so when we look at this, let's uh, let's uh, compare Christianity to Islam, and then I'll get back to some of these things regarding uh, ISIS, which shows you that the symbols are right there in Washington, and the reason they're doing this is they're shoving it in our face to say, look, you know, I know there's people out there like you, Greg that understand this but you know something if you talk about it you're going to be labeled a terrorist because you're talking about you're talking against Christianity against Catholicism well I'm not talking against it or against the Muslim faith but I'm talking about how certain people are using these three faiths and and we we'll, might as well add Judaism in here to create conflict killing, death, and basically leading up to another huge war. So do you want to compare uh, Christianity to the teachings in the uh, Quran? Well, why not? Why don't we do it right now? Just some things. And uh, I'm just going to uh, state what's in the books and what Muhammad said and then what Jesus said. Now, he said that Allah does not love those who reject Islam. Uh, Jesus said God loves everyone. That's in John 3.16. And the verse I read from Muhammad is in the Quran 30.45, 3.32, Now, Muhammad said, I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And that's in Muslim 1.33. What did Jesus say? He who lives by the sword will die by the sword. Matthew 26, 52. Now Muhammad factually stole, stoned women for adultery. Muslim 42, 06. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. John 8, 7. Now what's happening is that these extreme Muslims are using, well, let's call them extreme, because if this is written down in this book, 
isn't it easy for them to pluck these things out and basically stand by the truth they believe in the Quran? Now, what about all these other Muslims in the world who are don't agree with this? How do they reconcile it in themselves? That's what I don't know. I'd have to talk to a Muslim because the first thing I'm going to say is that most people do not when engage in war, and this show is not at all attempting to create any kind of friction or any kind of hatred. What it's trying to do is show you basically what we're up against here, what we're dealing with. And my questions have always been this, and to be fair, has man tainted both books, both the Quran and the Bible? Has Is that a possibility? And so to be fair, on one side, as I am on the other, let's look at all the changes that are occurring in the Bible that we see. And how long ago was this? Did it start? Now we know if you put these two books up against one another, they seem to be, in certain parts, conflicting, right? It could create a chaos, couldn't it? And did the people that were involved in these things have that in mind when they wrote the Bible? When they wrote um, the Quran? Those are only questions I have to present. Because on one side, Christians are going to say, well, this is the true word of God. On the other side, the Muslims are saying, this is. Now, how can that? how can people justify that and live together? Well, you can if you subscribe to a peaceful uh, chat about it. But when we are now seeing people being beheaded, just the other day, 21 uh, Christians from Egypt were beheaded on a beach uh, <clears throat> in the Middle East. So we're, And we're seeing people being burned to death. And we're seeing, you know, this kind of instigation to create a huge war and what's the reaction of american people can you turn another cheek to this of course not now whether terrorism is orchestrated or not at this point it's not the question because we could sit here till hell freezes over figuring that out while our brothers are getting their heads cut off so how do you deal with this first i think you deal with it ideologically right here but Secondly, what other choice is there but to put boots on the ground and basically protect ourselves and protect others who are going to be killed by these people? This is not going to stop. So on one hand, we're talking ideologically here, and that's fine. But on the other hand, while I'm speaking today, probably another 20, 30 people or a lot more are going to be killed or have their heads cut off over these, the things that I'm reading about. So, it's a very, very difficult time in our history of the world, and we're, we're in it. And I'm basically just trying to make sense out of it, and trying to diffuse any kind of hatred towards good Muslims that live in America, good Muslims around the world who do not subscribe to any of these things. But my question to them is how do they justify this uh, when it is written in this book that supposedly is the, uh, the Muslim Bible? And my same question goes out to my Christian friends. How do you justify some of the things that are written in the Bible uh, when it comes, I mean, we can pluck uh, things out of the Bible that seems to turn another cheek, or if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. Then we see these other things where there, you know, God seems to be unfair, where all the children were killed. I mean, things uh, e- allowing evil to uh, grow and grow. How do how do Christians deal with that? So we have a lot of different things to deal with as a faith. Uh, 
whether it be in the Islamic faith or the, the Christian faith. And then I ask my Catholic friends, how can you call yourself Christian when you see the traditions of the Catholic Church basically uh, at odds with the Christian Bible? Uh, I mean, there's so many things in Catholicism that are non-Christian. How do Catholics justify that? And then when we add all of the uh, shenanigans of Rome throughout the centuries and even till this day, how do you justify that? So there are a lot of different questions, but I always find that the Vatican's in the middle of all this stuff. And it's just, to me, uh, too glaring of a fact to forget about and just dismiss uh, by stating basically we are basically fighting Islamic terrorism that's it and we should band together well what choice do we have at this point when if they I'm wondering where is all this uh, money coming from to support the, all of a sudden this terrorist group popped up you know they say it's because of our uh, many people will say it's because of our um, uh, entering into this long, extended Iraqi war, one of the longest wars in our history, I guess. Uh, but where is this money coming from? It ha- you know, okay, is it coming from some of the rich, moderate, supposed moderate Muslims? Is there Western? There has to be some kind of orchestration of all this stuff. It's just too, it can't be coincidental is what I'm getting at. And so when we look at that question, immediately critics are going to say, well, we got a deal. What are you talking about? You know, you're just confusing the matter. Well, I don't think it's a question of confusion. I think it's a question of trying to get to the bottom of it and trying to say, okay, what is the root cause of this uh, terrorist onslaught now? This kind of instigation to lead us into a world war where we have uh, extremist Muslims, as they're calling them, wanting to kill every Christian or infidel in the world. But there's so many differences. Uh, like I said, uh <clears throat> Stoned, uh, I'm looking at some of the differences between Muhammad and, and Jesus. Uh, I'm reading from some of the, uh, just right from what it says in those books. It says, he, he, uh, Muhammad permitted stealing from unbelievers. Uh, Jesus said, thou shalt not steal. He owned and traded slaves. Neither owned or traded slaves. Now here's an interesting point. Vatican is owned or traded slaves. We can prove that. And they've been caught lying many, many times. Uh, now, Muhammad beheaded 800 Jewish men and boys, and that's in the Sahih Muslim 4390. And Jesus beheaded no one. But what about the Inquisition torture chambers of the Catholic Church, the Vatican? and all the people that were killed during the Inquisition. And there's similarities there between uh, the popes and Muhammad? Yeah, I think so. What about uh, in the Bukhari? It says 56, 369, 4, 241. Muhammad murdered those who insulted him. What about the popes? They did the same thing. But what did Jesus do? He preached forgiveness in Matthew 18:21. Those are just some of the similarities. And I guess some of the things that these extremists hang their hats on. And uh, to me, it's a bit scary. But anyway, let's get back to my point when I started the show, and that is, what's this word ISIS? Now, I've, I've noticed recently, in the beginning when this first thing hit, when ISIS was first uh, put out, into the uh, into the news media and the and the politicians started talking about it. Both politicians and the media 
refer to this organization as ISIS. Oh, I remember uh, Uncle Joe Biden, our uh, vice president, stated that we will follow ISIS to the gates of hell. We will all follow ISIS to the gates of hell. I'm not following her to the gates of hell. If you know who ISIS is, it's a Greek pagan god. But all of a sudden, after a while, the government refers to it as ISIL, but the news media continues to call it ISIS. So that's an interesting thing. I always wondered why they're doing that. But let's get back to what ISIS really is and how I believe that if you look at the signs and symbols of ISIS, you will see that perhaps these are the organizations that uh, are involved in uh, creating terrorism, creating uh, conflict, creating an enemy. Now, the most familiar, what would these government people do if there wasn't this, they didn't have a war to talk about? I mean, they're constantly talking about these things. They have nothing else better to do. They don't have anything good to do. You know, why don't you spend your time fixing the potholes that are going to come after this, uh, uh, after all this bad weather, this and this, forget about the red. They don't have anything else to do but talk about conflict and war and protecting you as they create the enemy, is my thinking. Now, the most familiar, unfamiliar fact is what legendary Freemason Manly P. Hall called the secret destiny of America. We've talked about this before. It's a vision mirrored in the design of streets, government buildings, and other artifacts important to the founding of the United States, including the Washington Monument, which is, a, which is a, dedicated to ISIS and Osiris, including and also including the Great Seal, where the phrase Novus Ordo Secorum is prominent. Now, in his second inaugural address, George W. Bush said of his, this phase, uh, that when the founders of America placed it on the Great Seal, quote, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. So what is, I mean, he's telling us what exactly that is, but it goes in one ear and out the other, doesn't it? Now, according to Mr. Horn, he states that what is troubling is that this God, in quotes, is specifically identified in the Bible as the spirit that will inhabit the Antichrist. In other words, unknown to most Americans, the great seal of their country heralds an ancient prophecy of the man, the coming of the man of sin. I've been on a, you know, this, he says this, uh, uh, <coughs> Mr. Horn stated that he's been interviewed uh, by 33-degree uh, Masons, congressmen. Uh, he's been in some top, top ten talk shows, none of whom have refuted the findings or his conclusions. Quite interesting. They don't talk about it. Has anybody in the news media ever asked the question, why are we, what is that, why is the Washington Monument uh a representation or a worshipping of ISIS, and then where did this name come from, and why is a Muslim group using it? Uh, during research for, for his book, uh, he traveled to Washington, D.C., and uh, met with Masons at the House of the Temple in the headquarters of the Supreme Council of Scottish Rite. Now, he said these men were cordial and most responsive to the questions even confirming our understanding of the influence of Freemasonry in American history. Only when, pressed one, only when he pressed one of them about a ritual called Raising Ceremony, the raising of Osiris from the dead, a.k.a. Hiram Abiff, which is conducted in a temple room on the third floor of the building, did these Masons become evasive and visibly uncomfortable, he said. Now, he said the reason for this, and let me check the time, Okay, we're all out of time. I'll be back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, 
To get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Okay, we're back on the investigative journal, and I left off in the last uh, half hour <clears throat> regarding uh, a book written by Thomas Horn and getting to the bottom of uh, what Washington, D.C. is really all about. And he was uh, talking about his book to a bunch of high-level Masons in Washington, D.C., and when he mentioned the raising ceremony, uh, the raising of Osiris from the dead, a.k.a. Hiram Abiff, which is conducted in a temple room on the third floor of the building, that these Masons become a bit evasive and visibly uncomfortable. And he said the reason for this is that in addition to the raising ceremony being conducted when members reach the 33-degree level of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, the strange ceremonial is performed without public knowledge in the temple room at the inauguration of every president. Why? Because the deep esoteric meaning behind Egyptian and Rosicrucian magic that was incorporated in the rites and rituals of Freemasonry holds that the spirit of Osiris can be raised from the underworld and installed, for want of a better term, in the reigning king or president. This is why the U.S. Capitol Dome was laid out so as to face the obelisk known as the Washington Monument as well as other puzzling architecture in the government center. Now, I'm going to, there's a few things in this book. Let me read to you. He says, uh, a quote, unrecognized by vast majorities of people around the world is the greatest conspiracy of all time. Sitting right in the open in Washington, D.C. and at the Vatican, it is the ancient magical talismanic diagram, the lost symbol, based on the history and cult of Isis, Osiris, Horus, and the prophecy of the deity's return. And isn't it interesting that this terrorist group is called Isis? And you hear that word every day, hundreds of times now. The principal concept was designed in antiquity for the express purpose of regeneration, resurrection, and apotheosis for deity incarnation. From the underworld to Earth's surface, through union of respective figures, the dome, ancient structural representation of the womb of Isis, and the obelisk, ancient presentation of the erect male phallus of, of Osiris. And in ancient times, uh, the obelisk represented the god Osiris missing male organ which Isis was not able to find after her husband brother was slain and chopped into 14 pieces by Seth. Isis replaced the missing organ with an obelisk and magically impregnated herself with Horus, the resurrected 
Osiris. This legend formed the core of Egyptian cosmology and was fantastically venerated on the most imposing scale throughout all of Egypt by towering obelisks, including at Karnak, where the up, upright obelisks of Osiris were vitalized and stimulated from the energy of the masturbatory sun god Ra shining down upon them. Modern people, especially in America, may view these symbols as profane or pornographic, but they were in fact ritualized objects the ancients believed could produce tangible reaction properties and manifestations within the material world. The obelisk and dome, as imitations of the deities, male and female reproductive organs, could, through government representation, invoke into existence the being and being symbolized by them. This is why inside the temple or dome, temple prostitutes representing the human manifestation of the goddess were also available for ritual sex as a form of imitative magic. Now why in the heck would the Vatican put right out there in St. Peter's Square an obelisk? Why would they do it in Washington, D.C.? And why would they do it in London? Though such imit going back to the, his book, though such imitative sex, the dome and obelisks became energy receivers capable of assimilating Ra's essence from the rays of the sun, which in turn drew forth the seed of the underworld of Cyrus. The seed of the dead deity would, according to the supernaturalism, transmit upward from out of the underworld through the base testes of the obelisk and magically ejaculate from the tower's head into the womb dome of Isis. In this way, Osiris could be born again or reincarnated as Horus over and over again. In Washington, folks, the obelisk built by Freemasons and dedicated to America's first president stands near the west end of the National Mall. It is the tallest obelisk of its kind in the world at 6,660 6, inches high, 555 feet, 666 inches wide, 55.5 feet, along each side of the base. In Egypt, where raising Osiris to life through these magical constructs was perfected, Pharaoh served as the fit extension for the reborn god to take residence in as the sex act, was ritualized at the site of the largest religious structure ever built, the Temple of the Amun-Ra at Karnak, where Pharaoh became the receptacle of the spirit of Osiris during the festival of Opet. The festival was held at the Temple of Luxor, where the pharaoh entered the Holy Womb Temple beyond the, beyond the obelisk and was trans, transmogrified uh, into a living deity, the son of the Amun-Ra and Osiris. From then forward, pharaoh was considered the incarnation of the god Horus, resurrected I, uh, Osiris during his lifetime, and in death experienced apotheosis again, becoming Osiris in the underworld, the dying and resurrecting God, a cycle repeated with every newly appointed king. Could that be what they're doing here? Thus Pharaoh was, just as the God ciphered on the great sea of the United States will be, the sun and spiritual incarnation of the supreme deity. Now, uh, even though these kind of things, of course, spawned a lot of controversy in his book, Apollo and uh, rising 2012, uh, these are really only the tip of the iceberg. There's not enough time uh, to in this show to get to the fullest details of all this stuff. Uh, it's just incredible what you'll find. Uh, now, uh, there should be work being done on much more. Uh, you know, people are requesting information uh, which talks about the magic binding square on the base of the Washington Monument, what really that's all about. Uh, there's so much more we could talk about as far as what's going on in Rome, as far as why is there an obelisk there. But this should give you some idea 
of what uh, I'm trying to mention is why uh, would American freedom be represented by this, by ISIS, by something that ISIS used to venerate? Now, now there is a Bible that is magically bound inside the square in Washington. It is the same Bible Dan Brown, a member in his books, called The Lost Symbol. But this Bible is only a small part, albeit a very important part of the complete schematic of the Lost Symbol diagram. Where the pic- entire picture is viewed, it, it was intended to be of all symbols and structures in the government center as a single por- uh, portrait, as well as why they were designed and laid out the way they were. What emerges is the true lost symbol, an elaborate alchemical con- construct that can only be rightly understood within the historical meaning of the symbolism. And what is it? asks Mr. Horn. He says, if the DC diagram is interpreted based on the classical and fixed meaning of com- combined symbols and beliefs of designers, not only did the metaphys- uh, metaphysicians among America's founders who had control of the capital's layout plan, a city in honor of the return of Apollo Osiris and laid the dawn of this new golden pagan age, uh, Cybele's prophecy on the Great Seal, but the blueprint in D.C. and the rituals conducted by Freemasons, both modern and historic, illustrate a high degree of operational magic intended to bring the prophecy about. The sole purpose of the rituals in these constructs is to raise the spirit of Osiris from the underworld into human form. This incarnation of Osiris is parodied in the House of the Temple during changes in the U.S. Presidents just as they were in the ancient Egyptian ritual of raising Osiris into Pharaoh. But the ritual in D.C. is rehearsed in anticipation of a greater moment in time, when the literal physical return of the entity Apollo Osiris will give birth to the Novus Order Socorum. Think of the rituals in the house of the temple as a warm-up for the Antichrist's actual second coming. To assure the arrival of Apollo Osiris will not be impeded by the influence of... And maybe that's where the Vatican comes involved here, folks. To assure that the arrival of Apollo and Osiris will not be impeded by the influence of Christianity, which so many American citizens have been devoted to since the country's founding. The lost symbol Bible was placed in a magic binding square inside the testes (laughs) of the D.C. obelisk of Osiris. Washington Monument. And according to occultism, this binding utility is meant to restrain the Bible's influence while allowing the seed of Osiris to materialize. Further confirmation of this is in the fact that these symbols were faithfully reproduced at the house of the temple. This includes the 13-stepped uncapped pyramid, like the one on the Great Seal and the pyramid on the top of the Washington obelisk, made of 13 rows of marble hidden beneath aluminum sheeting that rests atop the house of the temple, and a magic binding square with the same numerical values as the Washington obelisk. The magic square can be seen in the skylight above the temple room, which intentionally hovers over the raising of Osiris ceremony as performed. And he and Mr. Horn continues and says, the importance of these specific symbols and their numerological properties duplicated in the house of the temple cannot be overemphasized. In addition to the 13-stepped uncapped pyramid and the magic square, the house of the temple was placed 13 blocks north of the White House. There are 33 columns surrounding the building, and each is 33 feet high. The building's address also contains the number 33. And when you look at the D.C. layout with an understanding of ancient Babylonian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Greek, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian magic, and how the pagans use vertical and horizontal positioning of their structures, streets, temples, symbols, and lines to represent the supernatural connection between heavenly vertical and earthly horizontal powers, the entire scene in Washington not only becomes transparent, but reveals volumes. For instance... Note that the White House is positioned so that a direct vertical line from the house of the temple bypasses the edge of it to connect the Osirin Washington Monument. This illustrates that while the president in the White House has an earthly horizontal role to play, 
the supernatural administration of the will of the gods, that is, the vertical connection between heaven and earth, emanates through the Supreme Mother Lodge. It is here the raising ceremony is performed, which brings forth the seed of Osiris through the stem of the Phallic Washington Monument that is in turn ejected laterally into the womb of Isis. Now we know that we these guys can't get to their end game unless they have conflict and chaos. Thus, we have Isis. The Capitol Dome, where leaders are con- conceived to carry out the will of the gods upon earth. This is also where the deity's fleshly representatives can themselves someday reach hypotheses and become gods as depicted in the scene of George Washington overhead and in the Gnosticism of Dan Brown's book, Freemasonic Belief, and so on. Now, Mr. Horn states, let's see how much time we got here. Uh, He says that if you read his book, Apollo, Apollyon Rising, 2012, then you understand that this is why presidents are inaugurated there, as well as why they stand at the dome, which the founding designers admitted was a religious temple based on Freemasonry and devoted to Osiris, facing the obelisk whenever they give speeches that will affect the administration of the gods on earth. To stand at the dome and face the obelisk is a public act of respect Recognition and honor, subservience to the powers historically represented by these symbols, Isis, Osiris, <coughs> and Apollo. But what he's uh, working on now uh, is he goes deeper, uncovering the historical importance of magic, the magic square, how it worked and how it was used by the founding fathers in Freemasonry and Rosicrucian in tandem with the uh, with things such as Solomon's Key and the Lesser Key of Solomon, which was so important to these ancients. Now, he also discusses the 72 pentagrams at the base of the Apotheosis of Washington in the Capitol Dome and how they were all used by Freemason Gnostics to control 72 Cosmo craters over Earth. And he also tries to reveal why the 36 cube magic squares numerology, 111, 555, and 666, which binds the Bible in the base of the Washington obelisk, is repeated in the skylight in the house of the temple, above which the raising ceremony is performed. Now, by the uh, Lodge's own admission in Washington, their 36 cube skylight symbolizes the vault of heaven, and his stylized magic square of the sun god Apollo and Osiris, used for binding and loosing the supernatural presence. The skylight magic square represents the celestial influences, while the square at the Washington obelisk represents the earthly or underworldly powers. Now, Mr. Brown, or Mr. Horn continues, when these two counts of 36 are joined, the complete 72 supernatural agents, 36 plus 36 equals 72, within the occult system, are recognized. We'll even point out, he says in his next work, how Obama, like George Bush before him, sent the appropriate signal to those who were meant to understand it when he acknowledged this mystical value 72, saying he would complete his first 100 days in 72 days, and on the third day, 73rd day, I will rest. So I believe these guys are worshiping something that we have no idea, most Americans have no idea about. I believe that these symbols have a great meaning and should be divulged and should be talked about. And I believe they created this terrorist group, ISIS, so they could bring about their end game. And that's why they're using the word ISIS. Now, I believe this stuff really is important to to look at. And when you do some homework regarding... Uh, really what these signs and symbols, uh, it, it becomes clear why they named this terrorist organization ISIS. Now, uh, in closing, I did want to mention that uh, 
how do you deal with this? I mean, here we are faced with uh, what I believe is the beginnings of some rough waters ahead for America. Uh, and what does this knowledge uh, impart? What what do you, what what uh, what good is it to talk about all this stuff? People will say. Uh, the reason is is that if you start understanding where our country came from, who has been con- been in control since the beginning, you have a better idea of seeing how you know living in a world that seems to be a bit uh, crazy and <laughs> upside down, doesn't it? Uh, if we look at the world picture right now, the battle lines, of course, are being drawn. And all I'm saying is that this is a orchestrated effort to bring about another world, a huge world war, pitting, as the people, commentators and people were stating, this is, we're in a holy war right now. However, they never get into the fact of who orchestrated this. What is the Vatican's role in this? What is really the Washington Monument really stand for? What does the obelisk in Rome stand for? And isn't it kind of amazing when you put all this together and you see they come up with this name ISIS? And it gives me uh, an indication that... Uh, They created it. And when I say they, I mean, look, people at the top can work together. Now, I have a feeling that all these top leaders, including the leaders in the Vatican, all work together orchestrating this thing and all playing their their role and doing it quite well from a standpoint of creating conflicts. We have those who are the hawks now wanting to kill every ISIS terrorist, we have Obama, who's talking a more apologetic uh, strategy of creating jobs for uh, a third world that has no hope, and this is where terrorism comes from. But at the same time, he admits that many of these guys come from very wealthy uh, Middle Eastern families. So the point is... Uh, I believe Obama's right there to prolong this, not taking a very, you know, if we wanted to, I mean, we could go over there and end this thing in a matter of days. But that's not their intention. Their intention is to keep it going till it blossoms into a world war. And that's what Obama's role is now, to not take decisive action. Bush had to take decisive action to get the ball rolling. Now they got the other side built up and fighting, and they're going to build it and build it and build it until there's a huge conflagration. Now we have, on the other hand, Russia and the Ukraine going at it. We have, of course, bad relations with Korea, North Korea. China seems to be siding uh, not with us, for example. And so maybe the battle lines are being drawn. But if you look at Just the symbols that are out there for you to see. You might not be able to stop this train wreck. But by looking at the symbols, you get an idea of what really is going on. And you're not going to hear this from anybody on the news, on the mainstream news. You're not going to hear it from any of your celebrities who like to now, you know, take take the podium and become uh, political activists, you're not going to hear this story from anybody, because if anybody with any money in this country ever did it, they would be out of a job and just as poor as the poorest American, and they don't want that. They'll play the old magical game of, oh yes, let's tell the American people this, while we worship that. And Hollywood's a great example of this. I mean, they, you know, watch some of their movies. They tell you a lot of this stuff in their movies. And they are a mouthpiece for uh, those who worship uh, Osiris and 
ISIS and all these things. And uh, kind of interesting to be on the sidelines watching this right now in history. And by understanding it, it makes it even a lot more entertaining, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, but anyway, uh, don't, you know, see, I enjoy listening to some of the conservative news shows just to uh, listen to how they communicate to one another. And uh, it gives me enough ammunition to uh, present you the other side of the story that I try to do on this show. And I want to uh, give uh, Tom Horn in his book some credit for uh, a lot of the things I, I mentioned today on the show. And uh, go out and get his book. Uh, it's a Polyon Rising 2012. And I look forward to some of his other uh, investigations and uh, his next book. All right, so we're all out of time on the Investigative Journal. You can catch my show every day, Monday through Friday, on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Have a good evening and good night. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.